everything's on fire all the time and you probably don't have any time to fix it. If that's you, you probably work at an early stage startup. Or you're an arsonist. Well, that doesn't really make much sense actually, because you wouldn't care about fixing it. Anyway, this video exists to give practical ideas about what you can do if you're an engineer working at an early stage startup. They might not be top 10 most important things to do at your startup or something like that. They're meant to be really for engineers, they're practical advice, and they're not stuff like work hard and do better, although that is helpful advice, I guess, technically. If you're working on something early stage, you're probably using a lot of pre-existing components and tooling and services rather than building stuff from scratch. It's obviously very easy to get moving super quick, but it ends up having a sort of house of cards on Netflix, all seasons available now, start your free trial. <laughs> now you end up with a house of cards where if one thing breaks underneath, you end up with a bit of a mess. Anyway, most services have a service status page that you can go to to check up on the status, but I'd recommend early on, it's really useful if you go to all these service status pages and set up a notification system to send messages into your communication system of choice, like Slack, Discord, Teams, I guess, people use Teams, I don't know, and send all these messages into there so that it's available for everyone on your team to see. It'll send messages like just increased error rates, scheduled maintenance, and full outages that everyone on your team can see, so you don't have to update people when things are going wrong that you don't have control over. Last week, for instance, there were heightened error rates in our region on Vercel, and we were getting a lot of errors on our functions, and the founders were on a sales call at the time, and there was error rates coming up, and that's the kind of scenario where it's super useful to have a log of what's going on and you know that it's not something you've done or your the engineering team has caused and it's just something out of your control rather than a mad panic about what's going on. You've probably heard the Paul Graham quote, do things that don't scale, and you're going to continue to hear that if you work in startups forever. It's going to be drilled into you. Drilled into you? No, okay. <laughs> The idea is that early on you want to do labour intensive manual tasks to get that early traction rather than worrying about whether something is scalable or not. That means you're really going to lean into those hacky solutions that, you know, are a bit ugh. And I found it's really, really useful to have a good admin dashboard that anyone on your team can access to put these hacky solutions into. That's why as a B2B business, we were able to cut corners where you have to do setup early on to save us a lot of time and just put an action for it in the admin dashboard. So examples are Stripe integration. Instead of the faff of setting up Stripe, we just send a Stripe link to the organization that's signing up. And then once they have, we are able to enable or disable their account with a true false, which is set in the admin dashboard. We have webhooks that are sent to us. And if they fail, we can just retry them within the admin dashboard. We didn't end up setting up email notifications. We instead just send an message when long running tasks are finished, when we get the notification from that service that something has happened. I know it's hard to cut corners. I'm sure everyone watching this has the sharpest corners I've ever seen, in like this, sharp as hell. But, <laughs> but in the early stages, you're proving that your startup has a right to exist and it can find product market fit and you have a limited amount of time to do that. So things like Stripe integration aren't worth that time really. Just cut the corner and put it in the admin dashboard and save yourself a few hours. We use Retool, that's just because it has a Postgres integration and I can send it to anyone on the team. And that's super important because everyone needs to have access to this as well. It doesn't want to just be an admin dashboard for you. It needs to be something that is usable by anyone on the team. Everyone makes mistakes. I make a ton of mistakes, so I know. Code reviews are a really important part of making sure those don't go into production. But when you feel the heat of a deadline, it's probably the first thing you're gonna phone in. So I'd recommend early on putting in the effort to streamline the PR process to make it simple and easy to do these reviews. Code Rabbit is a tool that I'd really recommend. It does AI code reviews on your pull requests that let you handle stuff like styling and formatting and small nitpick mistakes that mean that when you actually do a code review, you can focus on the overarching architectural decisions and things like that, rather than going back and forth on pointless stuff. There's other things you can do as well to streamline this process, setting up a nice PR template early on so that, you know, they're very easy to write. And also when you're reviewing, it's sort of step by step. That's super helpful. There's plenty of bots out there that you can put in. One like ImageBot, which compresses images that you put into your repo, things like that, to really just make the process a lot quicker. You might be thinking, isn't this just CI CD? 
I mean, technically, I don't know if it comes under the banner of CICD. Probably. The point I'm trying to focus on here isn't CICD, which is super important, but is sort of an iterative, never-ending process of improving your automatic workflow stuff. This is more about how you as a team structure your PR review process and make it so that it's super simple to get started and do your reviews. The things I'm suggesting here should take less than 10 minutes and save you a lot more time cumulatively than 10 minutes. As soon as anyone starts using or even seeing your product, you're probably going to be inundated with feature requests and product feedback, and you don't really want to be spending time building something that people don't want. There's books like The Mom Test. I, I hate the, the term mom. I'm British. It's mom or mum. I mean, you Americans probably don't even know the term mom, but we will not, we're not litigating that now, okay? They tell you the best ways to get feedback, and I'm not going to give advice on that. But what I will say is that feedback is going to be like a fire hose of information. And it's really important that you have a good way to categorize it, organize it, and go back to it later. Harry, who is our head of product and technology, came up with this template. It's not exactly rocket science. You put in a feature request, how many people have requested it, and then you'll slowly see things tick up as more people request certain things or give the same feedback, then the stuff at the top is the stuff you need to build. The value of this is having a single source of truth about what your users want that anyone can add to and anyone can look at, which kind of takes the ego out of product development. I know in the past I've had strong opinions about what I think people want that are influenced by my own bias that maybe were incorrect. I, I mean, I'm never incorrect, but sometimes we're incorrect. It also helps because you don't have to write out a rigid roadmap. We've often written a roadmap three months in advance to rewrite it in a week. This just means whatever's at the top of the list is the most important thing. Communication is what I've really struggled with working at a startup. You can't really over communicate, but your whole team needs to know what's going on or have the tools to access the information about what's going on at all times. As an engineer, you probably are best placed to have this information, but you as early as possible want to eliminate yourself from being the filter by which people find out stuff about the product. Because if you're the guy who knows what's going on in the product, you're inevitably going to bring your own bias in about how the product is being used, spend more time updating people and less time writing code, and you'll miss something important and there won't really be anyone to pick you up on it. That's why I'd really recommend getting product analytics set up super early and also making it super easy for anyone on your team to access those analytics. Setting this stuff up early gives the team the tools to access this information early on to make timely and informed decisions. Stuff like spotting when users are dropping off during onboarding so they can improve conversions and reduce churn. Alert the customer success team when a high value user becomes inactive so they can proactively reach out. Things like this will really help and having you be the person who has to manage when these things happen is going to be a nightmare. I'd suggest Postog for this. It's my favorite tool because it's super easy to set up and it has a bunch of other stuff in there like feature flags and surveys, but you can do something a bit more simple like setting up a trigger that when a user signs up, it sends a message to Slack or Discord or set up Sentry to do that when there's errors, which I'd really recommend as well. We have a system where whenever a new organization signs up or whenever they do key events within the platform, we're able to send messages into Slack. That way the founders get it and they're able to reach out and do all that customer success onboarding stuff that we found really helpful. So that's it, that's what I got. They're my tips and my tricks. And I found these to be super helpful. Hopefully they help you out. There's two big themes from these though. I'd say the main things are to keep your team informed as best as you can from an engineering standpoint. And the other thing is don't waste time. Don't waste time building features that people don't need or waste time adding in things that won't prove that you have product market fit or not. Focus on the stuff that you need cut that stuff out. Hopefully this stuff's been helpful. I've been Owen from work. That's the name I've decided, I guess. I don't know. I like that it had 444 in terms of the words. It just looked nice. But that is the only reason I came up with it. Anyway, thank you.